Good morning, City Life. Good morning, City Lifers, everyone out there. If you're listening to me, I am so grateful for this opportunity for us to be together one more Sunday and preach the good news about Jesus Christ. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Pedro Reese, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we're so grateful that uh, we get to tell you about our Savior, Jesus, today. I wanted to start off today with a story. Uh, years ago, in another context, in another place, uh, I had this friend, and I was older than him, and he came up to me one day, he's like, Pedro, we need, I need to talk, I just need some advice. Uh, and I was, I was taken aback a little bit because this person was someone that I had, I really trusted, I felt like this guy, he really thought about his faith, he was, I, I, he was smarter than me. Um, he was someone that I could just trust to think about the life that he lived and, and hold it up against the gospel and go out and look for, for answers and in the word. And so he said, Pedro, can we talk? And I was like, yeah, of course. I really like this guy. And so we went out and talked. And um, he, he, he started to tell me the story. And before I say it, just hear, hear the heart of the story. I don't want it to be like, oh, here we go. Just another pastor talking about premarital sex. It is, it is about that, yes, but listen to the heart of what this guy was wrestling with. He came up to me and said, you know, Pedro, I firmly believe that Scripture allows us to be uh, having sex before marriage as long as there is some form of commitment to one another and as long as it's monogamous. And, uh, he was like, okay, he's really smart. He went out and he, he sought out the answers to this or maybe he just sought out proofreading what he wanted. And he said, okay, these two things, if I do this, and I think it's fine, I think that I can do this, have this part of my life, and it'd be okay. And then I was like, okay, uh, I really disagree with you. I don't see that in scripture anywhere, but then what, what's the problem? What's going on? Why did you want to talk about this? And he said something, and it really opened up my eyes and taught me a really valuable lesson. I said, like, if this, if you really believe this, and I trusted this guy to really believe in the things that he did, so then, then why do you want to talk? Where are you having this struggle? And he said, you know what? Every time that I, I go and have sex with someone I'm committed to, and or every time this person leaves, leaves me, we break up and we go our own ways. It's like I, I always feel like there's a part of me missing afterwards. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting because I think that is so true about life. I think that that's one of the deeper lessons that we learn on the, our journey to know Christ better, to live him out, to understand his gospel and what he did on this world. I think it's so important, especially as modern people, to realize that we are more than just you know the physical, more than just our bodies, that we have a soul and a spirit that are constantly screaming out to us in pain or like, I. You might think this makes sense. It might make all the sense in the world. We can use our logic to really talk a lot of things through. I was like, but there's just this part of him that was not letting it be okay. There was a part deep down in his heart and his whole and his spirit saying, you know, I was made for more. Why are you doing this? I was made for more than just being cheaply given away. Well, what's, what's going on here? And that there are parts that are deep in us that have been made to know Christ and only be experienced by Him and one other person. That there is this part of us that God wires us that even people who will never hear the name of Christ, we have all been wired to know Christ and to pursue Him. And that when our souls and our hearts and our spirits don't agree with what we've decided, they speak out and shout out, and that's where we feel this unrest often in life. And I loved that interaction that I had with my friend because it taught me this deep lesson of, you know what, just because I can make it make sense, it does not mean that my soul agrees with this. It does not mean that my soul is being edified or that anything good is coming out of this. And, and this is the idea of our text today. This is the heart of our text where we're going today and next week. It's that we were made to live lives that were visible, exposed lives open in, in front of God and one another. It's that we were designed as people to live in communion, unbroken, 
communion with our Lord, with our souls bare wide open, and also with one another. That our lives are to manifest that God's truth are real and for us to make it evident to everyone around us, whether they know Christ or not. To me, this, this friend's story was just so, it so perfectly taught me this lesson that there is no part of life that is good when it's hidden, that there's no part of life that I can benefit from darkness, from doing something that does not align with God's word. And so that's where we're going to be today. Again, that we are called and have been made informed that our souls are made in a way and our spirits are made in a way to live open, visible, exposed lives to everyone and to our Father. And so let's break it down. Let's pray before we go in there. We're back in Ephesians this week. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5 to 14. But before we even go into that, let me pray for us to let the Holy Spirit teach us of what it means to live visible out in the open lives, to have nothing to hide, to be a part of darkness in no way. And so let me pray for us to join in, to get into God's Word together. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for how good you are to us. I thank you that there is nothing that can keep us from your love, like we talked about last week on your Resurrection Sunday, Lord. I thank you that you have built a covenant with us on grace and mercy that we will never live up to our calling and yet you have made the way for us to have forgiveness and peace with you. I, I pray for a measure of that peace today for us to hear a new measure word about the evidence of our lives and how we're supposed to be open and vulnerable with everyone around us to shine your light in this world. Lord, we love you. Walk us through this passage. Walk us through with your power, your understanding, and your clarity, Lord. We uh, lean on you to help us make sense of the things in your word that we know are challenging to us. We love you. Be with us. We give you back this Sunday morning, and we, we ask for you to be present in our service. We love you. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, we're in Ephesians 5. We're back in our mystery series. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 5 till halfway through 14. And God's word says this. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. So this week we are back in our mystery, season, mystery series through Ephesians. We are back at looking at what is called the Queen of the Epistles, this beautiful letter to the Christians in Asia Minor and Ephesus. And Paul has already done so much heavy lifting. He has already showered us with so much truth in just a few short chapters. We, we've talked about our four major categories. We've been through three of them already. The first one being new life. That when I find Christ, when I say yes to him, I have new life. That there is nothing about me that is part of what I used to be. That I am completely new. Whether you say yes to Christ in this high emotional experience or whether you just obediently, I'm like, yeah, I have nowhere else to go. I have no more answers as to why you are not my Christ. And whether it's just a big emotional experience or if it's just done out of truth, out of obedience, whether you feel it or not, there is something fundamentally changed in you the second that you truly believe and call on him. Where you say, yeah, okay, Jesus, you are my Lord. 
I become this new man. I become this new creation. I take off my old self, like old clothing, right? And I put on this new life, this new walk that I've been given. I am a new person. And then we also talked about our second major theme, which was new society, that as you and I and that person and that person, the person across the world, as we come together and say, Christ, you are my Savior, that he starts to put us into his family, grafting us into his adopted family, establishing the church in the world. And not just City Life or Hope Jersey City or Redeemer Jersey City Fountain of salvation or liberty church yeah those are all local expressions of this body but us big capital c church around the world are god's his new creation of humanity that if i am now fundamentally different if i am a new person then all of us are new and god is slowly person by person heart by heart soul by soul recreating humanity ushering his kingdom one heart at a time that the church is, is more than just the, what we know is broken and hard and difficult and disappointing and even evil at times. No, but the church, the real church, the remnant of God's people is God ushering in his kingdom and changing everything about this world. And now this week and next week are our last weeks in our third section of new measures. New measures is just like looking at the evidence of my life and seeing, hey, do I, do the way I live my life, is it measuring up to the standard of Christ, the example of Christ, this guy that so perfectly loved everyone that no other competing religion except for pure rebellion has ever debunked Jesus' love and life and ethic, that he is the height of human morality. That am I living up to this man? I will not be perfect until the moment I meet him. Like Ephesians says that I see the one who fills all in all. I will not be perfect. But am I pursuing him? Is it evident in the way I live my life that I have met someone that I think created me and has existed before any of this existed? As a, the new measures is not about conformity, but it's everything about transformation saying, I am a new man, I am part of his new humanity, I've taken my old self off, I've put on this new self, I am a part of Jesus' bride, the church, and I want to live every part of my life in God's new society and his ethic, and I want the evidence of my life to show, yeah, this is my Savior, this is the one who I say is the Alpha and Omega of everything. I want to be a part of Christ's pride on this earth for every moment. Every breath I have is an opportunity to further know him and to further exemplify him to the world. I also love how new measure is all is a message to Christians, to all those who are Christians. Whenever we hear God talking about, okay, like this is the standard, this is the ethic, live up to this. Don't make an excuse for sin. That is speaking to you and to me as Christians. That we have been called to live beyond what we all know we are capable of and most of the time want to live. And so Christians, whenever you hear a new, message, a new measure sermon, you say, this is for me. This is not for all these heathens out here, all these pagans. It's not for them. Like Christ talks to me because I am his kid. Whenever he tells me to do something about my life, let that pierce my heart. That's him telling me, moving me closer to him. And for non-believers, listen, this is the standard that we have been given, but this is not the standard that you are being forced to live. You don't have to change your behavior to be a part of God's family. No, that you have to accept Christ first. And so listen to this because we believe this and this is right. But this is not us saying, you know what, you have to change everything about you before I'll ever know you. Before you ever belong to God's family, you have to get better. No, that's not it. I also wanted to say that this is a two-part sermon. So this is like every classic uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air episode or Saved by the Bell episode or every uh, episode of The Greatest Show Ever Made, The X-Files. Uh, where it just fades to black and it says to be continued. And so we're picking this up, but really we're going to finish this next week. 
this is a word of new message for you and for me. And so let's jump right on in. Let's talk about the first thing that Paul talks about. We're calling this the certainty of judgment. Let's read verses 5 to 7. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. This is the first thing that Paul talks about in, in this section here. He goes up until now from verse chapter 4, verse 17 to 5, 4. He's talking about behavior. And now he's talking about motivation. He's like, what's the motivation of your life? And one of the very reassuring but also scary things is that if we are pursuing Christ's righteousness, we if, we, if we're truly there, if we're truly committed, if we have heard our Savior call our names and we have not turned our backs on Him, then we have, can rest assured that we have been removed from the certainty of judgment. Here, Paul specifically is highlighting sexual sins, right? He says, all those that are sexually immoral and impure, those who are covetous, those who are idolaters, those who we talked about a couple weeks ago, those who are just like greedy to practice whatever they want to practice, who are greedy to be like, oh, I want to do this and there's nothing that's going to stop me. Those who are covetous and that whatever they see and it grabs a hold of their heart, they'll do whatever it takes to get onto that physical momentary things like, okay, whoever has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and who has turned their backs on it, they are like the, chill, the sons of disobedience. This is a, we're starting off with fire already. Like, okay, this is a severe statement that Paul is making here, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so we have to make sense with it. And it also has to align with the rest of Scripture, and especially the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we live under a covenant of grace. So this isn't saying, you know what, every time you have bad thoughts, every time you see a beautiful person, and you're like, oh, shoot, okay. It's not every single thought that you have, but this, you become a son of disobedience, a daughter of disobedience, when you know the truth, when you have encountered Jesus, when you have heard his gospel, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to turn my back on that, and I'm going to go out and get what I want. A son of disobedience is, is someone who has heard the truth of the gospel, has really heard and grasped, and not just like, okay, whatever, Jesus thing, no, but who has heard it, and who it makes sense, and yet they turn their back willingly and deliberately to walk away from Jesus. This is not us who is like, okay, like, who've experienced repentance and guilt, who hear the Holy Spirit telling us, convicting of our sins. No, that it's not about every time you are doing something wrong, you are being a, a child of dis a son of disobedience, and the Holy Spirit's going to strike you dead right there. No, it's not that, but it's the ones who have heard and who have walked away because they are so greedy to practice what they want. I also like how in verse 7 here, Paul talks about, you know what, don't even, therefore, do not be partakers with them. I think that this is another severe. This is not like saying, okay, don't even know them, don't associate them, don't be so quick to hide in your Christian bubble that you live your whole life every day, week by week, and you're like, oh, shoot, I don't even know if I know someone who doesn't believe in Christ. It's not saying that. It's not saying, okay, go to church and huddle in there, stay in there. That's the only safe place in the world. No, but the word here in the Greek for this partners is um, don't be partakers participating in what they do. But this does free us up to our association. We belong to a Jesus who was friends with all of the sinners, who said that he was the great physician for those who are sick and not for those who are well that he hung out and had meals with prostitutes, tax collectors. He went out and touched, physically touched lepers. And in their impurity didn't reach him, but his, impu his purity healed them. Uh, John Stott writes this, and, and I really like it. I, I really like what Stott has to say. At the same time, he has also addressed to us this warning about the danger of forfeiting our inheritance in God's kingdom. How can we reconcile these things? 
only by recalling that assurance of salvation is neither a synonym nor an excuse for presumption. And if we should fall into a life of greedy immorality, we should be supplying clear evidence that we are, after all, idolaters, not worshippers of God, disobedient people instead of obedient, and so the heirs of, hev of not of heaven but of hell. The apostle gives us a solemn warning. We shall be wise to heed it. A new measure sermon, a new measure portion of text is designed to like kind of give us a smack in the face and say examine your life take a breather take a step back pause the busyness of this world for a moment and let your life be examined by the holy spirit let god point out to you in the areas of your life where you're like okay i am i'm not living up to how i should be here I will never stand in front of you, this church or any church. I will never be a condemner or a judger because I know that I am not righteous enough. Only God is righteous to say who and who isn't living up to the measures that we've been given. But how is the evidence of my life showing me where I really get it and where I need to get it? Let this new measure passage challenge us and every new measure challenge us to say you know what god god has made me to live a visible life in the light in god's truth and so i want to live it out in every area where's the evidence of my life and how is it showing me that i'm living up because the worst thing i can do is get to the end of my life and say oh my goodness i never knew christ or I treated God like an idol instead of my king, my word, my God, the one who could tell me how to live my life. I thought I was just giving him, I thought I was giving him my life, but I was just giving him lip service so that I can make it through another week and do whatever I wanted. But no, am I letting the gospel and my relationship with Christ transform everything about me? This is a sobering warning and let it ring in our hearts and let us give the holy spirit rooms us believers to be where am i where am i getting it and where do i need to get much further i will never be perfect until i pass away from this world and meet christ and i am resurrected into his glory but i i'm done making excuses with doing what i want to do in this life paul takes this up and he keeps on taking this metaphor this is the story. If you live for Christ's righteousness, you are removed from the certainty of judgment. But then he also starts talking about light to discern. Let's read verses 8 to 10. God's word says this. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. If you were under the impression that Paul had no more tricks up his sleeve, if you were the impression that, okay, okay, we got past all of the uh, ways in which the gospel just challenged me to the core of my identity, if you're like, okay, now we're just gonna set, so we're setting our sails to the end of this letter until we get to a new book, and Paul's not going to change the way that I'm supposed to look at myself, the realities that God speaks over me instead of all of the things that I say about myself. If you thought we were past it, then Ephesians has one more trick up its sleeves, one more time where it takes us by the hand, spins us around until we don't know which way is up or down. Because Paul has another truth bomb to tell us about who we are in Christ that changes everything about how you are supposed to view yourself and your fellow Christians. Verse 8 starts it off. I don't, we cannot miss this this morning. It says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. If you read this at a glance, you're like, okay, that, that seems like very Bible-y stuff to say. I think we've heard this already in Ephesians. We've been talking about being in darkness and being in light. But that is not what Paul is saying here. Let's read it a little bit more carefully. It says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are in you are light in the Lord. 
He's not saying that you were in darkness or now you are in light. He's saying that you were darkness and now you are light. Subtle difference. Theologically changes everything about how you look at yourself and live your daily life. You see, we, we, we don't belong to a God who's just saying like, you know what? I'm going to change your environment. I'm going to change everything around you. I'm going to make all of your circumstances work so that you can be prosperous, make a lot of money, and just like be this example of, okay, wow, he's so successful in everything that he does. She is, oh my goodness, she is so put together. Are you kidding me? I want to be just like that. I'm going to say yes to this Christ so that I can look like that and have their car or their job or their 401k. No, it's not that the Christ work is so deep, so fundamental, so good, and that it changes our very nature from being darkness to being light. I am now God's light in this world. I am now, as here he calls, a child of light. This, to me, is so significant. I read this this week. When talking about the light, of uh, being the light, I heard this, not just our environment has changed from darkness to light. This radical transformation had taken place in the Lord by virtue of union with him who claimed to be the light of the world. Now since we are light in the Lord, we belong to it and live in it. Our behavior evidences light because that is our identity. Let me read that last verse one more time. Our behavior evidences light because that is our identity. The work that Christ does is so, so permeates everything about me. It changes me and makes me light. That I am God's light. Wherever I go, I carry his light with me. And so where am I taking it and how firmly am I holding on to it? Let's start with some self-reflecting questions here for a bit. Let's let this go in before we ever look at what it does to others around us. Look at your life and let yourself be challenged about, do I even accept this light of being God's light? That is even just too beautiful for me to have ever hoped. Like, Lord, I would have been okay with you just saving me, but not only just saving me, you made me your light. Are you kidding me? Are you like, are you crazy? I am not ready for that. Yet God has made us his light. And so do how do I hold on to this light? How do I bring it out? How do I have confidence in it? How do I let it change everything about me? The places that I go, how I talk to people, where I go to talk to people. How, do I let the gospel shine in my life? Do my behaviors and my actions and my budget evidence that I know the one who I say is the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of everything? Do I believe in the one that Ephesians 1 talks about, who made up his mind to have me before the foundations of the earth were ever set? Do I make the gospel shine in my life for people to really genuinely see it? Now, one of the fears I have around this question, is the, because I think I had this earlier on in my faith, is I hear questions like that, and I think it's common for many of us to be like, okay, well, I'm not called to be a pastor. I don't like being in front of people. I'm not loud in a room. I'm not some alpha male or alpha female just commanding the presence of the room with my magnetism. I don't have a job where I like to stand in front of people. I work in a cubicle and I just and I do my work and I like to go in and out. Like, No, it's not about being loud. It's not about being boisterous. It's not about being the center of the attention and everything. But it is about letting this light change the way I view myself to say, every time I go in a room, I'm lighting that room up for Christ. I have the possibility, I have the opportunity to perhaps be a bearer of God's light to people who may be in darkness, who are also may be in light. I don't know. It's this opportunity to be living out our faith, actually practicing the stuff we read in Scripture about being confident in my standing with Christ. 
about being gentle and humble and understanding and loving when I want to hate and I'm called to love my enemy when somebody is yelling at me how am I blessing them how am I making it evident that I belong in the Christ and Jesus who told me to turn the other cheek who told me to live in confidence and in power who changed the world from out of gentleness and meekness how do I let the Holy Spirit speak to me and is, do I actually believe that he can or is that stuff that only happened in scripture days? How am I hiding the light that I have been given and made to be because I'm afraid I don't want to answer questions that I don't know, that I don't want to be the representative for Christ everywhere that I go because I'm just ill-equipped. Now, how do we say like, Lord, I have so many fears and anxieties around being your representative, your light, evidencing you in the world. If that's a word, I hope it is. So help me, Lord, to live this out, to show the world what the light looks like. And Paul here even tells us, he, he says something here that's beautiful in verse 9, the fruit of light, that we are supposed to be children of the light who practice these fruits, three fruits, everything that is good and right and true. Good in this, the Greek word here is defined as uprightness of heart and life, kindness and virtue. How are you practicing everything that is good, everything that is upright about the posture of your heart and the way you carry out your life, how you practice kindness and how you are known by having good virtues. The second one, right, righteousness. It's the state of him who is as he ought to be. Righteous, oh, and it's also the condition acceptable to God, purity of life, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. I'll read that one again. It's the correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. That I let Christ mold the way that I think, that I let the gospel change the way that I feel, and how I act in this world. And the last of the, these fruits, that I pursue everything that is true. Here, it can be defined as the sincerity of mind and integrity of character, or a mode of life that is in harmony with divine truth. To me and my life, how am I evidencing that I am God's light that I am supposed to go to all of the dark places of the world, shining his light, teaching everyone and myself how to live in everything that is good, right, and true. How do I do this by myself in private? How do I do this with my coworkers? How do I do this with my family? That is often the hardest place to live these things out. My friends, my neighbors, every the stranger that I have an interaction with. How am I being the light in this world? And Paul also takes this and he starts to break down the metaphor of light a little bit more. So let's talk about visible, not hidden. Let's read verse 11 to the first half of 14. God's word says this. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Since we are now God's light, how can we live hidden lives? The big idea for us this morning is that we have all been made to live lives that are open, visible, vulnerable, apparent, easily seen. Not that we are always social media stars or that I just want to be the center of attention, no, but I live my life in such a way that anyone has access to the things that I do in private, the things that I do in public, that I have nothing to hide, that there's no part of my life that is hidden in a cave or that is over there and I don't bring it over here, no, but that I have this oneness of life 
that I have nothing to hide. And if we are God's light, how can we even choose to be in secret? How can I choose to want to keep my faith a secret from everyone that I see every day? And they're like, no, I am light, and so how can I keep it away? How can I keep it hidden? Light can't be hidden. Paul tells us that the evil in this world, it should be exposed because evil anywhere is bad and it needs to be exposed that us just being this light in the darkness exposes darkness wherever it goes. I love how in the metaphor of light and darkness, it's talking about how darkness has no defense against light. There's no way that darkness can become darker or, or try harder to not be exposed. But no, the second light comes, it shines light on everything and it becomes visible. Darkness has no defense against light. It cannot hide when the light truly comes. And here, Paul, I know we're almost out of time, but Paul mentions two things about the two qualities of light that are inescapable. He says here, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. This is the twofold process of light. First, when anything is exposed, it becomes visible and everyone can see it. And so everything that I do in this life will one day be visible to everyone, whether I want it to be or not. Am I had do I have parts of my life that are hidden from my spouse? my friends, my family's lives. I have, I have had friends in ministry who I would have put my life's earning on and say, this person will not fall only to have them make mistakes, have parts of their life that were hidden. People that I knew for years and did not know that this was in their life because it was so well hidden. It's like, nah, <laughs> I don't want to live that type of life. Lord, that you would make every part of my life visible to me so that I can live a visible life in front of you and all the people in my life. And the second thing, for whenever something is made visible, it also has the opportunity to become light. A lot of commentators here write how they're uncertain of what Paul really meant, but to me, I'm convinced that what he means here is that saying, you know what, when the light comes into darkness, that thing that was there has an opportunity to see what the light really is, has an opportunity at redemption. And when something isn't hiding anymore, when it's not putting all of its energy of being kept a secret, but it's laid out bare and exposed, it has the opportunity to either say, no, Christ, I don't want you still. I'm going to stay hidden. Or I'm going to go hide somewhere else. Or I'm going to go even deeper in this. I'm going to lose myself again. Or when Christ comes into the room and say, this is the first time I am truly seeing the light. And I think I want this. I'm going to start pursuing this light. And so church, we have been made our, in our hearts, in our souls, in our spirits, everything about what truly makes me me. I have been made to be known by my Lord, by the one who made me, and I have been made to be known by you, by everyone that I encounter. That doesn't mean I'm telling everyone the most vulnerable parts of me, like, okay, we're going to work up to that. I need a friendship. I need some commitment. I need some trust here before I pour my heart out to you, but I will let my life be seen by you. I will take you by the hand and, and walk down this life with you if you say yes to me. I'm going to live out everything that is good, right, and true with you. And so, church, this is the first part of this sermon. Next week, we're going to tackle all the way up to, I think, what is it, verse 21. This is part one. But, man, we have been made to live lives that are out and open for everyone to see. Let us learn how to do that together in community as we pursue Christ in everything that we do. Amen? All right. Church, now we have a joint call. I know that usually we have a joint call the first Sunday of every month, but today we have the privilege of hearing from some of our CMA missionaries. We're going to be taking communion together, so you have, a go, have you a few more minutes to go and grab your juice and some bread, and then we're going to join this one call. We have no prompt questions for this morning, which I'm sure many of you are very excited about. 
but I am excited that we get to hear one of our CMA missionaries tell us about the heart of the mission that they are going to be doing. So let's jump over to our joint Zoom call together. We're going to take communion, then we're going to hear from our missionaries. And so we'll see you in hopefully about two minutes. All right, see you there. <laughs> 